Welcome to this course on public contracting. Today, we will talk about public contracting and the franchise bidding solution that has been proposed by Harold Demset in his famous Journal of Law and Economics article in 1968. This solution has been proposed and applied in order to deal with natural monopoly situations and to avoid the regulation failures. I will also talk about the limits of this solution, highlighted by the transaction cost economics and especially by Oliver Williamson's work. And I have in mind here especially the 1976 paper, CATV paper, that is an answer to our damn sets. The main conclusion of my talk will be that the franchise bidding solution is also plagued by its own failure. So maybe first of all, uh, I should be clear about what we are talking about when we are talking about public contracting. So what are we talking about? Public contracting are all those contracts signed between government and firms in order to provide public services. So when I will refer to public contracting, we will talk about public procurement contracts, concession contracts, public-private partnerships. I will not go into the details of what are the main differences uh, between all those kinds of contracts, but often, at least for concessions and for public-private partnerships, we are talking about long-term contracts with a provider that is investing and providing a public services in a natural monopoly situation. Think of water supply, highways, bridges, hospitals, all those infrastructures that need specific investment the government might contract for. Why is this interesting? First, because we are talking about huge amounts of money. Public contracts are estimated in Europe more than 10% of the GDP. Second, because government face plenty of problems with those contracts, and that's fun. And finally, what is cool is that economists have theoretical tools and empirical studies at ends to understand what's going on, and they propose solutions to improve the situation. And the franchise bidding solution I will talk about today is one solution that has been proposed by Harold themselves. So let me precise the main idea of the franchise bidding solution. First of all, you should note that Demsets proposed this solution in order to avoid the failure of regulation. So this is the main objective. You should keep in mind that the first objective is to avoid re re regulation. If, as a government, you need to contract with a provider that will be in a natural monopoly situation, the main idea of the franchise bidding solution is to replace competition in the market that is not possible because this is a natural monopoly by competition for the market. So how can you do that? You can do that and you look at the graph and, and you see what is the, the, the solution, the proposition uh, of our dam sets. You can do that by organizing a competitive bidding procedures in order to select first the partners that will be then a franchisee of the government. And then these competitive bidding procedures will make emerge a competition price that will be applied for the duration of the contract. Hence, we do not need any more to regulate, and we have a usually private company that is operating the public services at a competition price. So no regulation problem anymore, one efficient private firms that charge at a competition price. It seems to be a clever solution. Plenty of public services actually are contracted out with a competitive bidding procedure like that. But in fact, this is not so simple. And Oliver Williamson in 1976, and also Victor Goldberg, another very famous uh, economist, is in 1976 paper, argued that the characteristics of what is contracted out, the fact that you need some specific investment, the fact that you need, uh, you are you are concerned by uh, a transaction that is very uncertain, is what draw regulation problem. Regulation is not the problem per se. So it is not sure that this clever solution will work perfectly well. So let me enter into the details of Oliver Williamson's arguments that can be found in his, in, in his now classical 1976 paper. What are the limits of the franchise bidding solution? So the basic idea uh, about the limits of the franchise bidding solution uh, are the following. You've got several steps in the franchise bidding solution proposed by our dam sets. You must select your partner, you, may, you must uh, make the contract enforced, and you must, at the end, renew the contract. The idea of Oliver Williamson is just to say that because of transaction cost, you are likely to fail at each one of them, at each step. First, the selection stage. Things are more complicated than only asking firms to put a price in an envelope and then to select the firm that offers the best price. Why? First of all, because very often, if you are a government, you are not looking only for one price. Think of a highway. You need to have a different price for different kinds of consumers. Price is also usually not the only criteria. 
you, you, you are sometimes, very often, you are also interested by quality. So the government needs to be able to weight properly the different criteria uh, they are looking for to select uh, its partner. This is not simple, but not very, very difficult. More problematic is the fact that during the selection process, you need also to deal with possible collusion strategy between firms that are answering the call for bids. And just to remind that very often, public contracting concerns a concentrated market where firms could cooperate instead of um, playing the game of competition. And we've got plenty of examples where collusive behavior have been detected and fined by the competition authority. Also, corruption might be an issue. Sometimes corruption is going hand in hand with collusive agreements. Another issue concerns the fact that organizing a competitive bidding procedures might, might not lead the government to select the most efficient firm, but sometimes the most optimistic one. Because of lowballing strategy, you might select the firm that is the most opportunistic, that is proposing you a very low price, anticipating that she will renegotiate the contract. And because every long-term contract are inherently incomplete, she will likely be able to succeed in renegotiating, in renegotiating the contract. And lastly, still at the first step of these procedures, when you try to select your partner, you might also select, instead of selecting the, the most efficient one, you might also select the most optimistic one, the firm that is anticipating that the future demand will be high. This is what we call the winner's curse effect, because usually, the firm's revenue are depending on the future demand. The most optimistic firm is also the one that will likely go bankrupt. That's why we call that winner's curse. And this is not what the government is looking for. Sometimes, clever and simple solutions might be implemented. So what I would like to stress here is that at every step, and especially at this first step, you've got some problems, transaction costs, and so on. But you might find some, some solution, and sometimes clever and simple solutions might be implemented. For example, in a very interesting paper, Engel, Fisher, and Galetovich in 2001 proposed a solution to the winner's curse effect. It is a solution that is theoretically grounded. You have a formal model to analyze the good properties of the solution. And what is even cooler is that it works. It is applied in several countries. And this is what they call the least present value of revenue solution. So let's have a look at the graph. And let me explain the idea very briefly. So the idea is the following. Instead of asking firms to bid with a price, you ask them to bid with the least present value revenues they want to achieve during the contract duration. So the winner is the firm that is asking for the least present value revenue. Let's say this revenue is A in our graph. So the contract starts, the price is chosen by the government and not by the firm. Expected demand can be as expected, so there is no surprise, can be lower or higher than expected, so you are in a bad or in a good surprise situation. The key point here is that the contract duration will adapt by staying in force till the least present value revenues is achieved. With such a mechanism, firms know that they will not, not go uh, bankrupt. And, uh, and with such a mechanism also, what is very important is that their bid is not depending on the fact that they are optimistic or not. And this solution is applied in several countries, especially in Chile, for high-waste contracts. And it, it is quite a big success. So you see that sometimes you've got very simple solutions to those problems. If you succeed in selecting your partner, that is the first step of the solution proposed by, by uh, Demset, then Oliver Williamson and the transaction cost economy more broadly suggests that you are likely to fail at the second step, that is the contract enforcement step. Long-term contracts are incomplete, renegotiations occur frequently, investments are often not observable and unverifiable, leading to underinvestment behavior by contract firms, maladaptation problems also arrive, those enforcement problems will be addressed in another course. But just to convince you that the enforcement stage is not without any cost and problems, let me show you statistics about renegotiation very briefly. Here you've got a table showing you how frequently contracts are renegotiated in different sectors and in different countries. And you see that whatever the countries, whatever the sector, public contracts are characterized by a high probability of renegotiations. Renegotiations are the rule not the exception. Lastly, at the contract renewal stage, 
Oliver Williamson suggested that competition for the field is not anymore possible. Why? Because the incumbent is likely to win. This is because of what Williamson calls a fundamental transformation. The incumbent uh, in place that is operating the public services developed human-specific investment, giving him an advantage at the bidding stage. This creates switching costs for the government at the end of the contract. And that's exactly what we observe in empirical studies. For example, in a study concerning US cable television uh, in, in the US, Zupan in 1989 showed that the incumbent uh, suppliers were renewed in more than 99% of the case. This suggests that potential switching costs exist at renewal stage. In a more recent study, Shangano found that big French cities are more likely not to renew water contracts with their private partner at renewal stage, suggesting that big cities are more attractive, have more capacity to switch if they are not happy with their private partner. And small cities are not able to do that because of switching costs. So to conclude, we saw that the franchise bidding solution proposed by Harold Demsets uh, is an interesting one and, and has been proposed in order to answer to the limits of regulation. But what I try to show you and to argue is that uh, this solution is also characterized by, by its own limits. Of course, government can deal with those limits. You've got some clever solution, you've got some solution to those problems, that might be, but they might be costly. This is not a free lunch. Transaction costs will appear. And transaction costs are likely to be high, especially when the transaction is uncertain. Thank you.